I have three things for you today. A social change, a change of perspective, and a change of heart. So two years ago in 2021, the Public Religion Research Institute conducted a survey of Americans and asked them, what is the most important thing in your life? One of the options given was your faith, your religion, your relationship with God. 16% of Americans say that their religion is the most important thing in their life. That's one out of six Americans. 15 years ago, that number was 36%. Those dropped by 36% to 16% just in the last 15 years. Again, 15 years ago, the percentage of Americans who identified as Christian was 78%. Today, it is 63%. It's so one percentage point drop every year for the last 15 years. There's been a massive shift away from organized religion in the last couple of years, and in the Catholic world, we see it in our mass attendance that has gone down over the years. It's been going up since COVID, but we see it in our sacraments, like baptism and marriage. We have one baptism today, little Katie, but we don't have as many as we did, nor weddings as we did years ago. Is it any coincidence then that as the Christian influence on our American culture has weakened, that we've seen in our political world more ideological intensity and fragmentation? Is it any wonder that in the last couple of years, specifically, more and more people have been attracted to extremes of our political spectrum. According to a recent article from The Atlantic, the author says, Americans have substituted religion for politics. American faith is as strong as it's ever been before. It's just that what was once religious belief in a church or a Christian community has now been transformed into political belief. We're still just as religious, but now our house of worship isn't so much in a church. Now it's on a political platform. We have, if you will, rendered unto God, or rendered unto Caesar, rather, what belongs to God. That is the social change that has taken place in America just in the last couple of years. We'll come back to that later. But what about a change of perspective? This gospel that we just read is, I think, one of the most fascinating passages about the life of Jesus, because it shows the utter futility of politics and our changing social beliefs in the eyes of God. Here's why. The Pharisees are trying to trip up Jesus. They ask the question, is it lawful? Should we pay the tax to Caesar or not? Either way, Jesus answers, yes or no, he's trapped. To understand why, you have to know that there's not just one group asking Jesus this, this question. <coughs> there are two groups. The first one is the Pharisees. We hear about the Pharisees all the time. Jesus is calling them out all the time. The Pharisees, who are your more religious conservatives, followers of the law, they're your more traditional values. You might call them red state people. But then there's another group that Jesus is confronted by. And this is the Herodians. You don't hear much about the Herodians. Who are they? They're followers of King Herod, who is not a Jew like the rest of the Jewish people. He represents Roman incursion, this outside power oppressing the people of Israel. The Herodians are your more liberal folks, your relativists, pluralists, do whatever you want type of folks, basically what you would see on your typical college campus today. They are what you would call your blue state people. Very different from the Pharisees. In fact, these two groups hate each other with a passion. And what's going on today? They're both confronting Jesus with the same question. And they both have the same goal. We need to get rid of Jesus. They found a common enemy, and so as the phrase goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so the Pharisees and Herodians, the conservatives and liberals of Jesus' day, have teamed up against him. And Jesus is trapped. If he says, yes, you should pay the tax to Caesar, 
then he'll be labeled by the Pharisees as a left-wing radical. If he says, no, don't pay the tax, Herodians are going to label him as a dangerous right-wing revolutionary trying to overturn the government. So which is it, Jesus? What's your answer? Of course, Jesus doesn't fall for it. He's not playing their game. And as Jesus so often does, whenever he gets trapped with some type of question, he gets out of the trap with a simple one-liner. And his one-liner today is, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. The gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be placed into a box. It's not moralism or relativism. It's not traditionalism or progressivism. It's not conservatism or liberalism. Remember the story of the woman caught in adultery? This woman who was grabbed and thrown out in front of Jesus, and the Pharisees again tested him with the question, should we stone this woman, as is the rule of our background, or should we not? If Jesus says yes, he's consenting to her killing. And that would look bad. If he says no, then he's undermining the religious law and he loses credibility as a Jewish teacher. So Jesus is trapped. But again, his one-liners save the day. And so what does Jesus say? He says, let the one who among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. He gets out of the trap and everyone walks away. And then he turns to the woman, and what does he say? Has no one condemned you? Neither do I condemn you. But go and sin no more. You see, Jesus has mercy on her, which seems like he's letting her off the hook. But he also calls her to a higher standard to do better. The real Jesus lifts you up when you fall into the ground. But then he pushes you to strive to be more. Jesus says, I love you, but because I love you, I'm going to push you to reach your maximum potential. Now contrast that Jesus, that image, with our current political and cultural polarization. What do we see in politics today? To one extreme is ruthless, staunch conservatism, which aims to condemn people. On the other extreme, you have complete moral relativism, do whatever you want. Don't let anyone encroach on your rights. And we don't expect more of people. Look at our national political leaders. I mean, look at all of the Catholics who we have in our national scene, even in Washington, and they're all over the spectrum. Completely different views. You have so many on the right, so many on the left. The Catholic sandbox is pretty big. Lots of people fit into it. But what we can often do with that is that we use our faith, or we use our politics to justify our faith. We use Jesus to justify our political beliefs. And we say, all the things that I believe that my political party supports, Jesus would have supported all of those things. Unlike the Pharisees and the Herodians of Jesus' day who wanted to get rid of Jesus, what do most people think of today? Most people like Jesus. Whether you're conservative or liberal, whatever, most people like Jesus. Who doesn't like Jesus? But here's the thing. The Pharisees and Herodians got to meet the real Jesus who got in their face, and that's why they wanted to get rid of him. But do you know why we like Jesus? Why most people today like Jesus? Because we don't have to deal with him. He doesn't confront you and me in front of our face. Today's world has not met the real Jesus. If we modern political people, if our national political leaders got to meet the real Jesus, then we probably wouldn't be so quick to make him our friend. In fact, we might want to get rid of Jesus because he would upset the apple cart. Because Jesus would get in front of our face and he would say, I will not be placed into a box. I'm not fighting in your corner. I am not being changed to conform to your politics. It is you who needs to change. Now, that's just our political world. That's just all those people who don't come to church anymore, right? All those people who don't call themselves Christian. 
They're, they're the ones who are political, not us Catholics who come to church, right? Okay, think again. <laughs> Sometimes people in the church can be just as political as those outside. You see, we too can form our image of God and what God is asking us to our earthly political beliefs, man-made inventions rather than the other way around. We can easily render unto Caesar or some political party what belongs to God. What do we owe to our political systems? What do we owe to our government? Taxes, yeah? Service in the military, maybe? Few other things? But what about your core Christian beliefs? Do you owe those to the government? Are you gonna let your core Christian beliefs be determined by a political party that you support? Or are they gonna be determined by God? Right now, the church is in the midst of what's called the synod on synodality. In Rome, hundreds of people are gathered together who've been handpicked uh, by the Pope, and they're meeting with Pope Francis for the, this whole month to see how we can best reach out to those on the margins those who may be alienated from our faith, those who don't feel that they're a part of the body of Christ. Ideally, the Holy Spirit is the driving force behind this, strengthening us and uniting us as Catholics in our convictions. Unfortunately, this synod has been politicized. The majority of our American news media as they often do, latches on to controversial topics, takes the Pope's words and twists them and distorts them, and then suggests that the church is going to change its core teachings. And then opposite that, you have this reactionary side, the other side of the political spectrum, worked up and up in arms about church teaching getting undermined. Again, it's like blue state Catholics versus red state Catholics. Here's my advice. Let's not take the bait. Don't fall for it, because that's not what this is about. We need to think with the mind of Christ, not with the mind of politics. Politics change all the time. God does not change. God is so much bigger than our political bickering. When God gets pushed off the picture, then he's no longer a guidepost to our beliefs and our actions. Then many Christians, us included, our beliefs can easily be determined by CNN or by Fox News or by TikTok or by whatever other social media or news outlet that you watch, rather than by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some Christians say that if Jesus were here, he would have supported the right to abortion or that he would have advocated for gender theory, which has become very popular in recent years. On the other side of the aisle, some Christians claim that Jesus would have given unrestricted, unhindered support of the Second Amendment, or that he would have condoned the death penalty. Now, you can choose what you believe, but if you think that Jesus would have held those beliefs and taught that just because your political party holds those beliefs, then that is a perfect example of how your Christian faith has been determined by political allegiance rather than by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have rendered unto Caesar what belongs to God. If your Jesus just aligns with your politics and ideology, then he's no longer the Jesus of scripture. He's just a creation of us and our politics projected onto the Bible. Then what you're left with is a red state Jesus or a blue state Jesus. But what you don't have is the real Jesus. Because the real Jesus challenges you and me to think differently. To be different than what we are now. Our human tendency is to be egotistical, narcissistic. I'm right, you're wrong. Jesus takes that and he flips it on his head. Just as he was a threat to the Pharisees and Herodians, the conservatives and liberals of his day, he's also a threat to us today. He's a threat to you and me because he threatens our complacency. He challenges us to have a change of perspective. So finally, Jesus challenges you and me to have a change of heart. Remember the coin that they handed him? 
He said, whose image is on this coin? Caesar's or Washington's or Lincoln's or Jackson's or whoever else. Well, then their image is on the coin or the money. Give them the money. But whose image is on your soul? If it's God's image on your soul, then you owe him everything. Your mind, your beliefs, your politics even, your body, all of that belongs to God. And if we render unto God what belongs to God, then we won't become polarized. You won't become political. You'll have a heart for Christ and his gospel and to bring healing to such a fragmented world today. What's it going to be for us? Today, let's render unto God our whole heart and our whole soul, because it is to God whom we belong. 